Buenas noches. Uh, Sung Hoon, how, how long am I supposed to talk for? What's what's 45, 45 minutes and then 15 QA? Okay. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I assumed as much. It, it's just, you know, I, I wanted to check just at the last minute. <laughs> Okay, welcome to the first plenary talk of Asia 07. This is Michinori Suzuki from International Christian University. Today, we have an exciting talk by Dr. Michael Barry from Sogang University. Let me introduce Dr. Barry. Dr. Barry is a professor at Sogang University. His interest is on syntax and its interface with semantics and prosody. He has mainly worked on Ilocan and Romance languages, but, has, but also worked on other languages such as Taman or Mongolian. Since it has been a while to hold linguistic event inviting guest speakers in person, it's our pleasure to have Dr. Barry here. Today, Dr. Barry will talk about on reducing prosodic domains to phases, successes and challenges. Welcome, Dr. Barry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be invited here. Um, I want to thank all the organizers uh, and the volunteers and um, Professor uh, Sung Hoon Lee for inviting me. Um, I'm very happy. Okay, so um, uh, the slides, I put the slides up on Slack, but they're also available on that website there. Um, so you can download the, it's on Slack, so you can download them there. Uh, so just by way of um, a, a roadmap here, um, I just sort of listed what I'm gonna talk about to give some background and talk about the syntax phonology interface a little bit and give some case studies, um, uh, just a few case studies of some of the work that I and my research team have completed on this question and then talk about a few unanswered questions and venues for, for future uh, research. Okay. So, uh, and I just want to, this is my research team. Um, you, maybe you recognize um, Jungo Kang there because um, he's sitting right here. Uh, we listened to him uh, uh, earlier today and his co-presenter Hiran Chang there is uh, in the middle as well. And other people I've uh, worked, former students of mine and a colleague of mine. Um, so, um, uh, so uh, when we talk about interfaces, um, we have to understand what we mean by the concept of modularity. Um, so modules of grammar are distinct or discrete uh, and do not make reference to one another. And this was the early uh, structuralist view. Uh, phonology feeds morphology, which feeds syntax. Um, uh, going back to Bloomfield, which uh, is actually still influential. The, uh, I checked the most recent printing of Bloomfield 33 was, was in 2005. Um, so the, this strict modularity persisted until uh, possibly, uh, it was recognized before this actually, but distributed morphology. Um, so the reason we think ab about morphology, uh, sorry, modularity is, you know, there are various kinds of impossible rules. There's no language in the world that has, you know, uh, verbs that begin with a fricative raised to T and other verbs uh, to remain in little v or word final devoicing happens on subjunctive forms or existential closure takes place on bare nouns that contain a nasal consonant. No, no language in the world is gonna have uh, um, uh, a rule like this. And so that's why we sort of can think about, uh, let's say phonology and syntax as being discrete and the two don't talk to each other. Uh, and the Y model of grammar um, 
uh, sort of ensures this kind of modularity. Uh, so the, um, the, the two lines of the Y are, are syntax, things moving about. And then PF, and I, sorry, I should have put this on here. PF is phonetic form. That's where phonology happens. And LF is logical form. And that's where semantics happens. Um, so the um, uh, phonology and semantics are definitely separated here. And syntax feeds phonology under this model. Um, but uh, as we all, as we know, going uh, uh, back to sound patterns of English, we know that there's interaction between syntax and phonology. Um, uh, so just to give one example, um, what we call redocumento sintattico in Italian. Uh, so, uh, cafe, uh, so if we look at this example, hot coffee, cafe caldo, um, in uh, uh, some pronunciation, uh, in some, for some speakers, depending on the dialect, this K becomes a geminate and we get cafe caldo like that, te freddo in uh, example 1B. But, um, but it, this pheno phonological phenomenon is sensitive to syntactic environments. So we say papa manja, not papa manja. Um, uh, so uh, the idea is, uh, uh, sorry, pointing here is only useful to the people in the room. Um, so uh, the idea is that these contain different syntactic environments. And depending on the syntactic environment, this um, phonological either does or does not have, change does, not, does or does not happen. Um, here's another, another uh, quick example. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, uh, third tone Sandy in Mandarin. If you have two, if you have two third tones in the row in a row, the first one becomes a second tone. So the you know the usual like ni hao becomes ni hao, something along those lines. Um, uh, so here's you know an example of a sentence where you know all you know all of these uh, words just happen to contain third tone. Um, the, so those are the underlying tones, and I don't know why. Oh, did something happen? Was that me? Oh, okay. Um, uh, so if you have all these third tones in a row, it's not the some of them change, but some of them don't. Um, and uh, so uh, if we look, at, so looking at the surface tones, which I'm sorry they don't match up, there's some silly LaTeX problem. Um, uh, if we look at the, the syntactic structure of this, then um, it's the one, the, we get the change with um, elements that are close together syntactically. Um, so again, there's a, sim, a, a, sim, a interaction between syntax and phonology. Um, so uh, according to this structure, third tone, this very simplified structure, third tone Sandy is restricted to maximal projections. Um, okay, uh, so um, to summarize this little bit here, phonology, syntax, semantics all assume to be independent, but there's ample evidence for a syntax phonology interface. Um, and what kind of model will account for the observed interactions between uh, syntax and phonology, which is what we're uh, working on now. Um, and the, the thesis I wish to put forth is that uh, the prosodic structure uh, is heavily grounded in syntactic structure in a much tighter way than we are used to thinking. Uh, so syntax is organized into ma manageable units called phases. Um, so the phases include um, the traditionally the CP and uh, transitive or negative uh, little VP, um, uh, uh, Leggett, uh, Julie Leggett thinks that all the little VPs are phases. Um, uh, also the DP is often assumed to be a phase. Um, and little NP people don't talk about it very much, but uh, there's been uh, there's uh, evidence to suggest that little NP is a phase. And so what we mean by a phase is this is a small unit of uh, compute of syntactic computation. We build the phase, and uh, then we're done with that, and then we work on the next phase. What this means is if we have a big, long, complicated sentence like the book that John gave Mary yesterday was stolen from the library by a big man with. Uh, with funny shoes or something like that. We don't, um, we don't compute that whole sentence in one big holistic chunk. It's broken down into smaller chunks, uh, which we call phases. Okay, so each phase is sent to the interface, to the interfaces, PF, um, PF uh, for externalization for sounds, uh, sign structure for phonology basically and interpretation LF uh, where it's given meaning. 
Um, and so here's just a very basic skeleton of a simple sentence with a subject, a verb, and an object. And the color coding, which sort of, um, this sort of comes out a little bit, um, uh, just shows how the phases are um, uh, uh, taken care of. So there's, there are two DPs. Those are separate phases. There's the little VP, that's one phase, and the CP. So those things are processed in separate chunks like that. Um, there's also the prosodic hierarchy, um, uh, which is, you know, the, uh, this is sort of the, the maximal um, uh, 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 representation of a potential phonological so prosodic hierarchy. We're actually just going to be uh, talking about a subset of this. And so I'll, th this is what I'm going to go over in detail. The intonational phrase, um, uh, which is uh, usually the, um, the domain of intonational contours. Um, uh, the phonological phrase, um, which is sort of a larger phrase, and the phonological word, which is smaller. So this is just sort of a, um, an ad hoc um, potential uh, way to illustrate this um, hierarchy. Curious students study linguistics um, and uh, uh, organized the, roughly the way I've shown here. Okay. So, um, so uh, for uh, and what I'm going to, uh, how I'm going to investigate the syntax phonology interface today is through um, um, uh, uh, reduced nominal expressions. Uh, so I want to go over uh, first a um, uh, a theory of the uh, inter of the syntax phonology interface. And I want to show how it can be sharpened or simplified uh, into a way such that the prosodic domains make exclusive use of phases. Okay, so match theory, this uh, pro uh, proposes a direct relationship between uh, syntactic structure and prosodic structure um, uh, containing viable constraints uh, as follows. So the CP um, uh, corresponds to the inter an intonational phrase. Um, there's, um, you know, uh, which I'm not going to investigate very much here today, um, and also has been called into, conten uh, into um, uh, has been contentious. Uh, so Ishihara goes over tons of facts showing that that's not quite true, but since I'm not talking about it today, I can put that part aside. And then all phrases, all XPs, all phrases map to a phonological phrase, and all syntactic heads map to a phonological word. That's how match theory works. Um, so uh, we went over this history a bit before, so I'm not sure why I should, uh, I should have put that earlier. Um, the, the earliest um, uh, uh, discussions on the syntax phonology interface, as I mentioned, it goes back to SPE, Chomsky and Halley, 1968. Um, uh, uh, and the way that this is developed, um, is that there has been a sep uh, assumed to be a separate prosodic hierarchy um, that uh, the, the prosodic hierarchy, that complicated prosodic hierarchy that I showed you before exists independently of the syntactic structure of the, of the, of the phase structure that we can uh, see in syntax. There's been a growing consensus, however, that the prosodic domains are defined uh, exclusive, exclusively uh, by phases. Um, uh, relatively recent, the earliest um, uh, the earliest citation I can find for this um, idea is goes back to 2007. Okay, and this is what I want to investigate here, looking at reduced nominal expressions. Okay, so um, there are two phenomena that I'm going to uh, empirical phenomena I want to look at here. The first one is differential object marking. Um, and this is an instance, uh, a situation where the case marking on the noun varies with respect to a, a variety of properties, humanness, animacy, specificity, and definiteness. So the higher animacy you have, the more likely you are to be marked as an object. The more definite or specific you are, the more likely you're to be marked as an object. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. Um, uh, and the other one is pseudo-noun incorporation. Uh, noun, typically the object, but not always. Uh, is bare or has very reduced morphology, um, and it has semantic properties that resemble that of canonical noun incorporation, the mor morphological kind of noun incorporation that we know from Methuen and Baker and so forth. Um, and these two phenomena look kind of similar, but they, they have different properties. 
So let's look at an example. So here's differential object marking. So I found a problem versus I found a survivor. Oh, sorry, there's a, uh, that means survivor, not problem, obviously. Um, uh, so uh, if in this uh, dialect of Spanish, sorry, Spanish, um, the, uh, the direct, if the direct object is human, then it's obligatorily marked with this object marker here. Uh, but if the direct object is not human, then it's not. And it's more complicated than this. Um, the, the details go into more, de um, are, are more complex than what I've shown here, but this is just sort of a basic illustration of what I'm showing. Um, the other thing to, uh, uh, to note is that this thing has an article-like, um, um, uh, uh, some um, morphine here, the, what, the, the ah, the word ah, um, uh, which we don't find in uh, pseudo-noun incorporation. So here's an example from Nguyen. This is the um, sort of the original illustration of this phenomenon. Um, uh, so he is always, the first 7a, this is just a regular example. He is always fishing. There's the verb, um, uh, the subject and the object. Notice, crucially, the object is mar has plural morphology on it. It has a case marker on it, so it's marked absolutive. Here's the subject that's ergative, so it's a transitive sentence. So we have an ergative subject and an absolutive object. But then if we look at the um, uh, uh, example of pseudo-noun incorporation, here's the object now. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure why this didn't align properly. Sorry about that. Here's the object now. Um, that's uh, adjacent to the verb. Uh, and the subject is now marked with absolutive case as though this is an intransitive clause. Um, and so this is very typical of, of pseudo noun incorporation. Uh, so there's, um, uh, Diane Massam shows very clearly that there's, that, uh, that there's no morphological incorporation between these two things. Um, and that the um, incorporated object is actually a phrase, not a, a head. Uh, but the, we don't need to go into those details here. So I wanted to go through and look at some case studies. Um, uh, I'm rushing here. I guess I didn't need to rush so quickly. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, before I do that, I just want to, I'll just make a moment and sort of uh, summarize the main point that I'm trying to get across here, just so we're all on uh, track. Um, there... Historically, there's been a syntactic hierarchy composed of phases and a prosodic hierarchy of the, you know, the uh, intonational phrase, the phonological phrase, the phonological word, and so forth, that there were more there. Um, and these were historically assumed to be separate. Um, uh, we know that there's a an interaction between syntax and prosody, and it's been proposed that these two are somehow linked. Um, and uh, the most current theory of that was match theory, which I um, introduced uh, too quickly, I think, um, uh, that shows that um, phrases map to phonological phrases and uh, syntactic phrases map to phonological phrases and syntactic words map to phonological words. Um, uh, and what I want to show is that we can sort of reduce this even further and say that the entire computation is based solely on the phases. And so when the phase, when the entire phase spells out, it's the whole phase that becomes either a phonological word or a phonological phrase in a way I'm going to explain uh, as we go. But that's the, the idea is that we want to reduce, um, instead of having two separate hierarchies, we just have a single hierarchy. Okay, so let's uh, go through some examples. Okay, so um, prosodic domains, uh, and uh, you might remember this earlier from Jungu's talk, uh, sorry, earlier in the, in the day, um, that one way to identify a prosodic domain in Korean is with this uh, a contour. So you have this uh, THLH, the T being dependent on uh, the onset of the first syllable. Um, so you get the, uh, uh, the TH at the left edge and the LH at the right edge of um, of a prosodic domain. So that's one way, uh, that's one way to identify a domain. So here's an example, my older sister hates Yonga. So my older sister is um, a single prosodic domain. And here's the, the contour, it's low high at the left edge and low high at the right edge over here. And I made it bold faced just to make it easier to, 
to see. Um, and then let us stop voicing. This is also called intersonorant voicing, um, is another uh, indicator of prosodic um, structure in Korean. Uh, so uh, here's an example. Uh, so this word picture, kurim. So here we have a plain consonant, it's voiceless. Um, uh, and it just, it, it's, it's very happy to just sit there and be voiceless. Now, if it finds itself in a domain where it's surrounded by two things that are plus sonorant, two things that are voiced, um, then the K becomes a G. So this K here, it is stuck between the N and this vowel U approximately. Um, and the K becomes a G. So this is an example of Lennis, uh, uh, it, intersonorant, the general term for this is intersonorant voicing, but it's specifically in Korean, it's called Lennis stop voicing because it only happens with um, uh, plain consonants. Okay. Now, um, so those are the two phenomena that we can use to diagnose prosodic structure in Korean. And, and we'll go through more examples uh, when we get to some more of the data. Now, uh, where we're going to examine this is on uh, nominalizations in Korean. Okay, so uh, when a, a clause um, is nominalized, the, you have two possibilities. Um, the subject uh, 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 can be marked nominative and the object marked accusative. That's pretty straightforward. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that the subject is, has a genitive case, um, and the object is obligatorily caseless in this case. Um, uh, and it's impossible for the object to be marked with accusative case. And if the subject is marked with a nominative case, uh, then typically you can't do object drop here, um, uh, or sorry, case drop, I should say. Um, now there is a bit of variation. Uh, so in a, in a regular transitive clause, um, in speech, uh, people do case, uh, case drop all the time, uh, depending on the semantic properties of, 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 of what's going on. Um, uh, so in a regular clause, um, uh, people would accept case drop in this environment all the time. However, once it becomes nominalized, some speakers accept it. Um, some speakers still accept the case drop there, but other speakers uh, are much less likely to accept case drop on a nominalized verb than they are in just a regular transitive clause. So I just wanted to add that as a caveat that there's some interspeaker variation here. Uh, I'll ask Sung Hoon later what he thinks. Okay, so uh, here are, the, uh, this is a, a nominalized clause that would be embedded inside a larger sentence. Um, something like, um, I am looking forward to Young Hee seeing the film or something like that. So here you can see, um, the verb is nominalized. Uh, we get uh, nominative marking on the subject, accusative marking on the object. Uh, that's the one possibility. Or you can have genitive marking on uh, the subject and then uh, the object is obligatorily caseless in this case. Okay, so these, uh, those are the two um, uh, uh, sort of situations that we're going to be looking at. Now, um, and there they are again. So uh, what we're, we've assumed, um, we have argumentation for this in other work that we've done, and I didn't wanna go through it here because it's not the main point of what we, I wanted to talk about today, but we're, uh, we've assumed that the case marked nominals are a KP, which is you know, pretty, um, uh, it's a pretty innocuous assumption. Uh, and the obligatorily caseless nominal, uh, we've had, we have lots of evidence uh, to support the, the idea that this thing is just a bare little NP. It's not a full KP, it's, it has a much smaller structure to it. I'll show you the tree structures in a bit. Okay, and if you're paying attention, you might be able to figure out what I'm going to do here. So um, the, uh, the, the, uh, we, can, we either have the case marked KP object that looks like this, or the caseless uh, little NP object that looks like that. Okay, now, so with the object plus the verb, uh, so here are the test sentences again, um, and the consonant um, in question, so this little part here that's underlined in a funny way, um, notice that in both cases, here we have a P that's a plain, P, a cons it's a plain consonant, a Lenis consonant, and it's between two things that are plus voice, plus sonorant. 
Um, and here, uh, the same, regardless of whether it's case marked or caseless, in both cases, it's between uh, two things that are voiced. It's in, a, it's in a situation where it has the potential to undergo intersonorant voicing, let us stop voicing. Okay. Okay. So the underlined uh, uh, portion is the test for Lennis stop voicing. Um, and the bold face portion, so the, the sort of longer portion here, uh, is the, te the, the test portion for uh, the, the contour that we're looking for. Um, uh, so th this, that's very similar to um, the phenomenon that uh, Jungu uh, was looking at earlier today, if you remember his talk on WH uh, fr phrases um, uh, in, in Korean. Okay, so this is the, uh, that's the situation. So uh, I'm not going to run through the numbers in, in great detail. Um, oh, now I'm, now I'm running behind. Um, uh, so, but what we can see is um, uh, 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 we tested this with a number of speakers and we get uh, a, a marked difference between um, a positive, whether voice positive, positive VOT means it's uh, there's no voicing and a negative or zero VOT means there is voicing. Um, and we get a marked difference uh, between uh, whether the subject is, okay, whether the uh, subject, uh, this is a confusing way of presenting this, meaning whether the subject is nominative, in other words, the object has a, a accusative marking on it, or whether the subject is genitive, in which case the object has no marking on it, it's obligatorily caseless. So when the object is obligatorily caseless, we typically get the intersonorant voicing, and when the object is a full KP with the accusative case marking on it, we typically don't get the um, uh, uh, intersonorant voicing. Um, uh, there, it is, oh, there it is in a, a sort of a simpler, presented in a simpler way. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, it's, this distinction is not categorical, uh, but uh, uh, it, 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 it's a marked, um, uh, you know, we get a marked opposite uh, um, uh, uh, pattern here. Okay. So it seems as though the little NP object plus the verb together acts as a, a prosodic unit for Lennis stop voicing. So the little NP object and the verb together, if you if inside that domain you have a Lennis stop in between two voiced things, that Lennis stop becomes voiced. But with the KP object and the verb, they act as two separate uh, prosodic units for Lennis stop voicing. So if you have a Lennis stop at the end at the at the border between these two things, uh, then uh, they're processed separately. Um, so uh, the 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 idea is that Lennis stop voicing it looks at this thing, and then it, it looks at this thing separately, um, and so it's never going to see the the two voiced segments on either side of the consonant if that consonant is at the edge on the border between these two things. Okay, uh, and the con the the pitch patterns, which I sorry I don't have the the diagrams here for you. Um, the the KP. Uh, uh, after the full KP object, the contour is reset for the verb, so they don't uh, seem to phrase together. But the little NP object and the verb together acts as one domain for the this contour, the um, this telltale contour that you get in the Seoul dialect of Korean. Okay, so we're assuming the following structure for nominals. Now there are other functor, uh, functors here too, other functional projection. So there's a KP, a little NP and an NP. There could be other stuff too, but the other things uh, aren't going to matter for, for what we're talking about here. There's probably, a, there must be a classifier phrase because you can say things like two apples and uh, uh, four, four people and so forth. Um, uh, now, one question that um, uh, sort of comes up in this discussion uh, and I'm going to show that, um, so under match theory, this question is important, um, although difficult to answer, uh, but under the approach that I want to take, this question is not is going to be moot, uh, uh, although it's an interesting question. Is there head movement in, uh, in head final languages? It's always difficult uh, to tell uh, because it would be vacuous movement at, at the extreme right edge of the clause and you can't see if anything's moving. It's not like English and French where the verb moves over an adverb and you can definitely see the head movement going on. 
in uh, languages like Korean and Japanese, you can't see this. So Hanadal uh, actually have a very neat story where uh, there's speaker variation. Some speakers raise the V to T, some speakers don't. But uh, we don't really have a, an, a good idea of what's going on in head final languages for, for the nominal domain. Uh, so far as I know, um, I, I haven't seen any investigations into this. So um, if let's just say that no head movement takes place here, right? And so when we go to spell out the noun, so something like a noun, some, let's say there's an overt nominalizer and a case marker, and let's just say there's no head movement. So this is going to get spelled out. The only way to spell out the whole thing is to spell it out as a phrase. Um, if there is head movement, then the, the say the n moves to little n, which moves to k, and then you have a complex head here, and then that complex head gets spelled out as a prosodic word under match theory. Okay. Um, so match. Um, uh, Okay, so sorry, you could just keep that question in the back of your mind um, uh, for now. Um, going back to match the, the notion of match word, um, uh, it's typically thought uh, that uh, match word is sensitive only to lexical roots. Uh, 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 Lisa Selkirk and Sung Hun Lee have talked about this, um, and other people have talked about this as well. Um, so there, we're not, there's not really going to, there's not, there, we're not going to predict a difference between case marked and caseless nouns um, since they both have one lexical root. Um, so uh, if we're adopting the notion that phases map to prosodic domains, um, uh, what the proposal that we had, so this is based on earlier research that I did with uh, uh, Chang Hyo Ryan, um, what we said was that the little np is a phase, it maps to a phonological word. The kp is also a phase, the little vp is also a phase. Both of those map to phonological phrases. And then we, we didn't investigate the stuff high up, the clause, because uh, we're just looking at the nominalized uh, verb. So under this approach, there's really no need to consider head movement. Um, uh, so if we look, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just show that. Um, so uh, it's under the proposal that I'm, we're, uh, I'm trying to entertain here, uh, we never look at the, at the head level because uh, the head is never anything that gets spelled out. The only thing that gets spelled out is the phase, the KP or the little NP. Um, uh, so the head movement question sort of disappears for us. Okay, so these are the structures that we're assuming. So, um, I, um, so this is the one where the, the, the object is case marked. So the object is a full KP, and here it is, the object to the verb, and then the rest of the structure. Um, and what we're saying is that a, a KP maps to a phonological phrase, a little VP maps to a phonological phrase. Um, the other stuff will map out too, but I'm just looking at the, 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 um, this structure down here. Now let's look at the one where we have a uh, little np. So here's the, the genitive subject with a case obligatorily caseless object uh, for which we have independent evidence that I'm not going over here, that the, the object is just a bare little np. And so that's going to map out as a phonological word. And this will this as a v, little vp phase still maps out, sorry, I should be pointing over here, uh, as a phonological phrase. So there's the phonological word and there's the phonological phrase. Okay. Um, so this would look uh, something like this um, uh, under the, the structure that we're assuming. So here, they're both a phi, the, um, the, it's the little VP that we're looking at. The phi um, has uh, uh, a phi as an object uh, when it's marked accusative case and then, you know, the verb. Um, but when the object is caseless, it's just an omega. So um, what we, do I have it? Oh, okay. Um, so at the right, this thing here, here, this is, oh, you can, uh, never mind. This thing here is, um, uh, uh, we have uh, the, a board at the edge of the accusative K, uh, of the KP, uh, which corresponds to a phi boundary. And since we have a phi boundary, let us stop voicing, uh, cannot look on either side here. Whereas there's no phi boundary over here and at, the whole domain for let us stop voicing is the entire thing. Likewise, phi is also the domain for um, 
the, uh, the, the contour that, uh, that we investigated here as well. So um, this, th this phi is going to be a separate um, domain for the contour, whereas this omega, uh, the phonological word, uh, is not a domain. This whole thing is the domain for the uh, 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 phonolog uh, for the, the the contour. Okay. So again, what we're saying is that if the prosodic categories correspond to phases, this works out uh, quite simply. Okay. Um, on to I'm going to I guess I'll have to brush through this very quickly. Uh, but we saw the same thing in um, uh, uh, Mongolian. Um, uh, that uh, this is something Jungo and I worked on together. Um, so uh, in Mongolian, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, you have differential object marking and um, pseudo noun incorporation in the same language here. So here's just an example, uh, an idealized example from Gunstadseg of uh, if, um, if the object is definite, then you have to have accusative case marking. If the object is non-specific, then typically you don't get accusative case marking and then otherwise it's optional. Um, uh, and she also showed that um, there's pseudo non incorporation in Mongolian. Um, that's just an example. Yesterday I did book reading. So uh, that's an institutionalized activity. So that works just fine. Um, and so we're going to discuss the difference between the obligatorily case examples uh, in 13C and uh, the uh, pseudo non incorporation in example 14 here. Uh, so uh, this is the pair of sentences that we worked with. You know, I want to milk a mare, any mare will do. Um, this, so this is non specific. Um, I want to milk a mare, that white mare over there. That's uh, specific, but still not, def uh, not uh, definite. Um, uh, so there's no demonstrative or anything like that. Uh, and um, what we see is that there's a, we're assuming that the non-specific one is, corresponds to pseudo non incorporation and the specific one that's still, um, um, uh, there it is right there. Uh, the specific one that's still not case marked is differential object marking because it's non-specific. Oh, sorry, no, because it's, um, uh, because it's not, def it's not, it's not indefinite. Um, so in Mongolian, there's typically a word initial uh, low high contour um, on words. And what we found is that on the full objects, even the bare objects with wide scope, there's no case marking. We get the initial low high contour, um, but the PNI objects, which is diagnosed by narrow scope, uh, the I want to milk a mare, any mare will do, that one lacks the low high contour on it. Um, um, it's well established that this low high contour somehow relates to a prosodic word. Um, and what we're proposing is that it maps to the left edge of a non-minimal uh, prosodic word. Um, I want to, uh, okay, uh, let's just go to the structure so we can see how this works. Um, so uh, for the differential object marking, so whether the case is overt or absent, um, then what we're assuming is that we have this full KP here for the differential object marking and differential object marking just corresponds to whether this is overt or not. Uh, and for the pseudo non incorporation, that's where this thing is a bare little NP, which is a typical analysis for pseudo non incorporation if you go through the literature. Okay, so the phase um, prosody mappings for Mongolian that we propose are the following. The little VP is a phi, the KP and the little NP are omega, the phonological words. Um, this is different from what we had for Kareem, but what we're proposing that it's, uh, it, it's not universal. These, these mappings are language dependent. Okay, so this is the structure um, uh, for the, uh, the caseless, diff uh, the caseless um, object that scopes high, and this is the structure for the caseless object that scopes low. And um, so here, uh, this is a non-minimal uh, phonological word. So this thing is going to have the contour at its left edge. This is a minimal phonological word. So it, there, it's not going to have the contour at its left edge. Okay, so the key points here is that the prosodic structure is affected by phrase structure. And we get a KP with or without segmental material has a low high contour and the little NP does not is what we showed. Um, 
And uh, so the, for the full analysis, you can see our paper. I just wanted to represent, uh, to go over some of the points of it uh, to show uh, the, the, uh, the, the progress that we've made in reducing prosodic categories to phases. Uh, other studies, so in Uktitut, um, uh, this, uh, Compton and Pittman showed uh, that words um, that words that words in an institute correspond to phases, um, but their analysis crucially relies on little v not being a phase head. Uh, so there's no phi or anything related to the little vp because um, what they propose is that little vp is not a phase in this language. Um, uh, crucially, uh, interestingly, it's also been shown that there's no evidence for the category of phi in Inuktitut. Only, oops, that should, that should say um, intonational phrase, of course. Um, there only, um, the uh, Inuktitut has an intonational phrase and a phonological word, but there's no evidence for the level of a phonological phrase. Likewise, uh, Compton and Pittman showed there's no evidence for little VP being a phase in this language, uh, sort of highlighting uh, uh, the, the, the correspondence that we're trying to show here is that, um, uh, you know, so little VP is not a phase and likewise, there's no evidence for phi uh, in this language. Um, Black, uh, so I'm just talking about uh, some research that other people have done. Uh, Blackfoot sort of shows the same uh, in her, she has a massive, uh, you know, like nearly 500 page dissertation that you should read. Um, when you have a, a month to spare, um, uh, 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 that uh, uh, she has extensive evidence that CP and little VP correspond to prosodic domains, but there's no evidence anywhere in the language for TP being a prosodic domain uh, in Blackfoot. Um, uh, in other work, which I'm not going to go over because I'm almost out of time, uh, KP and little NP uh, have, have also been shown to be prosodic domains uh, in Blackfoot that I, in some uh, research that I've done with uh, a colleague of mine. Okay, so some unanswered questions. Um, you know, we still have outstanding issues, mismatches. This is, you know, a perennial case for anybody working on the syntax morphology, sorry, syntax phonology interface, uh, where we're trying to do some sort of a tight connection between syntactic structure and prosodic structure. Uh, Irish, um, there seems to be strong evidence that TP is a prosodic domain in Irish, which of course would be a problem for what I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, what are the identity of the phases? Uh, uh, so as I said, for Inuktitut, it seems that little VP just isn't a phase. Um, uh, so uh, going to the most recent incarnation of Chomsky um, uh, is that the only true universal, probably the only true universal is merge. Other than that, uh, everything else is is different, um, uh, is, is is subject to a cross linguistic variation, which means we need independent evidence for phases. So, in other words, it's not a part of our DNA that CP and little VP are phases. And I'm sure nobody's surprised. Uh, you know, you would think I was a crackpot if I said that these things are actually encoded in your DNA. So, if since they're not, that means we have to the child has to be able to acquire them somehow. Um, one thing we haven't looked at are embedded clauses. Um, uh, this is, if we think about it, um, let's just say that uh, the little VP, you know, depending on the language, we did see one, uh, uh, depending on the language, like little, little VP might be, a, let's say that corresponds to a phonological word. And if the embedded clause is a phi or uh, an intonational phrase, then we have a, a phonological word. We have a phonological word that dominates a phonological phrase, which um, uh, uh, we have, so which makes no sense. Um, and we don't, uh, uh, you know, there are people are working on how to overcome this problem, but it's a, a problem that needs to be overcome. Um, uh, so uh, one is strong evidence for TP as a prosodic category, also in Tagalog, this in Irish, also in Tagalog. Um, but so here's the Irish example, a handsome librarian will sell beautiful flowers. Um, so we see um, the 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 low high low high contours here and the high low high low contours here, um, which um, uh, Alfner talks about in great detail in her dissertation and in her MLLT paper. Um, so this is the structure uh, that uh, that she adopts for this. Um, 
So this sigma pi, which might look uh, strange to you, this is a proposed category uh, somewhere between CP and TP. That's the domain of um, uh, um, uh, 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 whether something is uh, affirmative or negative. So this, this sigma tells us that whether there, this is uh, an affirmative clause or a negative clause. Um, so I'm not going to talk about her structure for this but, and just adopt it as she says. Okay, so, um, but, uh, and she adopts, uh, you know, this, the conventional match theory approach to this where CP is an, is an intonational phrase. All phrases are, pho are phonological phrases and all heads are phonological words. Um, so here's the, the verb that's raised up. And of course, so it's a phonological word. The subject, this is a phrase, this is a phrase, this is a phrase, so they're all phi. And inside here, there are words, I just didn't bother to show them. But this is the structure that she adopts. And what she says is you get, if you adopt these two language specific uh, requirements for Irish, you get high low at the right edge of every phi and low high at the left edge of every non minimal phi. Um, and then if you look through this carefully, you see here's um, here's a phi. Th these phi's are all the same, so we have a high low. Here's a phi, and we have a high low, and a left LH at the left edge of every non minimal phi. So that's minimal, so it doesn't count. This is this is non minimal, so there's a LH at the left edge of it. This is non minimal, so there's an LH at the left edge of it, and everything works out very nicely. Crucially, what we see is a distinction. These are the, the subject and the object are both full KPs, but they behave differently. So the subject has an LH at the left edge and an HL at the right edge, and the object has doesn't have that left edge LH. So however we do this, we have to account for the subject object asymmetry. Um, so this, this is just an idea I had. So there's, um, um, you know, the, and I'm afraid, I'm worried that this gets a little bit too overproductive. Uh, but there's this notion of what's called phase sliding or phase extension. Um, so the intermediate phase is usually the little VP, right? Um, uh, but when we have head movement, it's been proposed that the phase edge slides along as the verb raises. So um, if, the, uh, if, the, if the verb raises here, then that's the phase. But if the verb raises up higher, then that's the phase. So however high the verb raises, that's that's the phase. That's that's you know, called phase sliding. Uh, and there's a similar uh, evidence, but from a completely different point of view from Ham, um, Hamlo, Hamloi and Sendroy, uh, where they show the same thing. Um, so uh, let's say if we adopt this, and then we adopt a, a very well grounded constraint called binarity. Uh, a constraint that requires prosodic structure to be binary um, uh, at some level, um, then we can get the following structures. So if we if the verb raises all the way up to the head of sigma pi, sigma phrase, uh, then that's the uh, minimal uh, sort of the intermediate phase. And then we get the structure at the left edge of the screen. But notice that this violates binarity. So we get um, uh, uh, if the uh, uh, thing sort of, uh, rephrases itself to look like uh, what we have on the right so that uh, we have um, uh, to respect binarity in our structure, uh, then we get the original structure, uh, something that's very similar to the structure that uh, Elfner originally proposed. And uh, we get the, if we use the same constraints, or sorry, the same mapping that she does for where the, 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 um, the tonal signatures uh, fall, uh, then we can get the same structure that she has. And I think I'm running out of time. That's it. So they're just the conclusion. Uh, independent evidence for syntax, uh, uh, independent, sorry, independent syntactic evidence for phases. Um, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I just, uh, that's the, okay, yeah. So uh, the conclusion is that I went over several uh, 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 ways in which, uh, uh, we can reduce the prosodic structure to phase level structure. I gave you some examples of previous work that I did on Mongolian uh, uh, 
and uh, a Korean and also some on Blackfoot, but I didn't go over the details and went over some unanswered questions. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your interesting talk. So do you have any questions or comments? Thank you for uh, my favorite talk yet about the syntax positive interface or syntax sound interface. I felt like I'm not a syntax person, but I felt like I understand uh, a lot of what's going on here. I'm very grateful. Um, I also have many questions, which I will not ask most of, but uh, you, if I, if I understood right, it seems like um, uh, we're going from syntactic structure to uh, giving us things about, in this case, uh, a prosodic structure. Um, but I know it's also uh, true that there are situations where the sounds influence what the what the ultimate word order will be. Um, cases like um, uh, Big Bad Wolf, uh, where I think you would normally have uh, big and bad in English should be switched if they, if they didn't have the sounds that they have, but the I, needs to be followed by the ass ah somehow. There's a, there's, a, there's a sound restriction. I don't know if you're familiar with this case. I, I think I know what you're talking about, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, the, so that would be, if that's a real thing, then that would be a kind of case where the sound structure influences the, what I would think of as the syntactic structure or what I would think of as the, as the word ordering, which typically comes from the syntax to ring spell out. I guess my question is, is there, if you're linking prosodic structure and syntactic structure so strongly through phases, uh, do you still have the opportunity for prosodic structure, to, I guess for the, for the directionality to, to go in reverse? So then, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, it's kind of an interesting question independent of what I've been talking about. So um, it, like, usual uh, sort of contemporary theories of um, uh, syntax and distributed morphology hold that uh, the segmental material doesn't appear until you get to PF. Uh, so the syntax doesn't actually see the segmental material. So that kind, if that's the case, then that kind of, um, um, th then that kind of uh, uh, pressure to, for things to undergo movement would have to take place at PF, um, uh, and you know, people do talk about PF movement of things. Um, uh, clearly, like heavy shift, for example. You know, I put the book in the attic. I put in the attic that big old dusty book that my grandmother gave me. So the object is now postposed. But if if all syntax sees is oh, this is a DP, why should I move it? Um, it doesn't know that it's going to be this big, huge long thing until the segmental material is put in at LF. Um, uh, and the, the short answer to your question is that, you know, we don't know, we don't, there is no standard analysis for um, how um, uh, 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 syntactic movement deals with uh, um, uh, uh, pressure from the phonological side. So uh, your question is a valid one, but the short answer is that we don't have an answer, but. I guess, in a system where you're trying to do less with matching and more, it, you get a lot of unification of the prosody and the and the syntax through phases. It looks like yes. So does it become does it become more possible for? I know you said you don't. We don't know how it yeah. goes, but it, is it does does this type of uh, uh, analysis make it more likely that you should see those kinds of uh, uh, things happening coming from the phonological side? than match theory or than previous theory, do you think? Mm, well, I think um, that is one thing, the, the, the hypothesis that I'm pursuing here and match theory as well, uh, both will sort of allow that kind of thing to happen because um, uh, uh, as will, the, another one that I didn't even talk about today, contiguity theory by Norvin Richards, um, uh, really has this thing where the, the the prosodic structure and the syntactic structure are being built up in tandem. 
not sort of like um, uh, in a modular way that we used to talk about. Um, so I think it's a, it's not really a result of uh, phase the the phase based approach that I'm um, uh, adopting here. It's more um, sort of a, a sort of a whole uh, a larger unified way of a, of approaching the problem by um, either having um, syntactic or phonological um, uh, operations interacting with each other, or in the case of match theory, they have um, uh, OT constraints that um, uh, that can see both the syntax and the phonology. It's more a result of the architecture of the theory, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm Shige Takamano from International Christian University. And um, I have a question about page 30. Could you please go back to page 30? Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, we can see the some exceptions like um, 12 voiced patterns for KP and seven patterns for you know, voiced part, uh, no, mm. you know, not voice pattern for NP. Right. And I, I'm just, um, I would like to, you know, confirm that you have some dif difference, you know, or you know, exceptions, um, as like phonetic effect. Or um, yeah. Well, oh, sorry. Um, uh, we we thought about this, and um, so various things. Uh, so uh, various things affect prosodic structure. So what we're saying is that the prosodic structure is dependent on uh, uh, phases, is what we're saying. But other sort of non-linguistic things affect prosodic structure as well, such as speech rate and interspeaker variation. So um, if, for the these, you know, so these seven instances, um, it's possible the speakers were kind of slowing down. Um, in which case we get uh, like some more separation of the prosodic categories. Um, or in fast speech, um, in fast speech, things that are two separate prosodic phrases can become two separate prosodic words, in, in which case we, you know, you get the, the, uh, uh, the voicing, the intersonorant voicing. Um, at, at the moment, I really don't know a good way to um, study the effect of speech rate on prosodic structure. It seems like I, I would need to talk to probably um, Professor Lee or uh, somebody who or knows more about uh, uh, phon phonetics and phonology than I do um, uh, to figure out a way to test experimentally how um, speech rate is affected, sorry, how speech rate affects prosodic structure. But I, that's where I would look anyways. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. This was uh, very interesting. So uh, Nick from uh, National University of Singapore. Um, so I, I guess I, my question is more technical. So you said that, uh, and it's really more clarification in nature. So you said that um, there's this mapping, right, of phases through spell out to like prosodic units. Um, but I guess it, it, when people talk about spell out, usually they say it's the complement of the phase head that gets spelled out, right? So, oh yes, yeah. So I was wondering, you know, what does how does that translate into like prosodic units? Do you see evidence like you know whether it's really the complement or is it actually the entire phase, including the edge and the head, whatever that gets spelled out? Okay, so yeah, there have been two ways of um, thinking about phases. Um, uh, so there are people who say it's the complement of the phase head that gets spelled out, and some people who say it's the entire phase uh, that gets spelled out. Um, and uh, in all of the phenomena that we've been looking at, uh, it all makes everything falls together um, very nicely if we assume that it's the whole phase that gets spelled out. Um, in the a, a lot of the work that I've seen um, from the PF side of things. It always tends to look like it's the looks tends to look like it's the whole phase that gets spelled out, 
And from the LF side of things, it tends to look like it's the uh, complement of the phase head that gets spelled out. Although the, the evidence there is a bit more tenuous, I think. Um, uh, I mean, that's definitely a question that I want to address in greater detail in the future. I just didn't go over it here. Um, uh, but uh, those, those, both of those views do persist in the syntactic literature today. Oh. Wondering whether this could like help, you know, decide that. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely like most based on like a lot of the stuff that I've been looking at with, well, with me and my colleagues, um, we tend to strongly favor it's the, the whole phase that gets spelled out. Yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to check whether students wanted to ask question. Sung Hun Lee from ICU. Oh, thank you uh, for the nice uh, talk. Uh, I just want, have one, com uh, one comment about the uh, match theory being characterized as direct approach. <clears throat> I think, uh, yeah, uh, there's still some people view it as direct approach because uh, it actually says match, but uh, a version of, uh, at least a version of Selkog or uh, my work with uh, Lisa, we treat it as an indirect approach because it's not, uh, it's reflecting the syntactic structure, but uh, in essence, what happens in the prosody is not by the, governed by the syntactic structure. So it's the interface that's uh, that's given and our new paper, recent paper basically argues that there's no match constraint per se in the prosody, but in the phonology, but actually there is an interface module that would actually generate prosodic structure even in the input, phonological input, which is a drastic departure from the uh, uh, standard assumption about mm -hmm. prosodic structure, which is usually seen as, okay, syntax is syntax, phonology is phonology, and in phonology, you build up the prosodic structure. But we are trying to say the match theory is actually, we, we provided some evidence that perhaps match theory is not uh, that direct mm -hmm. uh, in a sense when it comes to prosodic uh, 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 structure or uh, prosodic realization. But given that, uh, that's just like one comment. And like people are still, uh, many people think like maybe this is just direct. So uh, perhaps we can uh, talk about it later. But in 44, uh, slide 44, I thought uh, it caught my eye when uh, I think you mentioned, it's not written here, but uh, that this uh, syntax prosody mappings can be language dependent. And I was just wondering about that because it's like, wow, that's a huge departure from match theory mm -hmm. because uh, what we see in, uh, what we saw earlier that sentence clause become an intonation phrase syntactic phrases become phonological phrase or match with map with phonological phrase and uh, uh, morphological word map with uh, prosodic word that's the basis of uh, the architecture of the match series so actually if we start uh, finding evidence or arguing that actually this is not always universal but depending on languages, some of the phrases can match to a word. That's a really a new kind of worm opening. Like uh, what is the restriction in terms of what we can do and not? And I was just wondering actually uh, whether there is an alternative way of looking at the uh, uh, structures there. Uh, and one idea uh, that I thought of was, was uh, the KP is a functional phrase mm -hmm. and is there a way to think that actually in Mongolian, functional phrases are simply not mapped uh, to any prosodic structure? And languages like Shitsonga in South Africa, it has, it has been shown only lexical phrases matter. And in those cases, uh, could it be that uh, Mare in the left structure in particular, the case phrase that's mapped to a prosodic word, uh, it's just simply not matched to any prosodic structure. Uh, perhaps that can be an alternative analysis that we can uh, pursue. I don't know whether it's really the right way to do it, but that's one, one idea that we might be able to say. And I was also see, wondering whether uh, 
if it was some kind of prosodic structure, whether it can still be a phonological phrase and we use the idea of uh, Irish cases that you introduced later in the talk about uh, minimal phonological phrase and maximal phonological phrase uh, governing this kind of uh, pattern that we see. It's more like a comment uh, or like, mm -hmm. I don't know whether it, it can be answered, but uh, the idea that uh, syntax prosody mapping is not by the categories like clause, syntactic phrase, X piece, and word uh, on head, but that that to the prosody mapping can be vary, uh, varying depending on the language seems like a, a kind of a new idea to pursue and a, a, a quite a <laughs> drastic idea to mm, pursue. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I thought about that. Um, well, one of the, just to briefly answer or one thing that I wanted to say was uh, if, if we take seriously the idea that the only true syntactic, uni the only true universal is merge and then that's it, uh, then we cannot sort of say that you know, there's, there can't be a rule that says a KP always maps to a phi, or a, or for that matter, maps to anything. Um, uh, that all has to be available from uh, the linguistic input. Um, uh, and then to other, answer your question here, if K is invisible, you could imagine a language that's identical to Mongolian, uh, but, uh, and so has the structures you see here on the screen, uh, but has a prosodic rule that's sensitive only to minimal uh, phonological words, in which case the that KP would be invisible to prosodic. Um, so it is possible. Um, uh, uh, it, uh, I th it's totally possible that uh, what you're saying is, you know, like in Shitsonga, um, maybe KP just isn't a phase or something like that. Like what... Uh, like Compton and Pittman said for Inuktitut, little VP is just not a phase in that language. Um, uh, and so some of the cross-linguistic, um, it just means that uh, all of a sudden there's no more, uh, if you know we keep on this route, there's really no universe, we, we can't make any sort of strong universals. All we can do is um, map out the structure um, based on the available linguistic evidence, uh, sorry, the linguistic evidence that's available to the child. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Questions from Zoom is also welcomed. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the presentation. Could you go back to the slide where you present some uh, Korean examples? I don't remember the page number where you present examples about someone seeing the film. Yeah, this one? I think so. Or maybe the previous slide. I was trying to translate these sentences in Japanese and curiously, I I, I thought the last one was impossible in Japanese. Uh, not, uh, yeah, 11B. Mm -hmm. For instance, I, I can't say Taro ga ega miru. Uh, Taro no ega miru no. Uh, is it is it grammatical in Japanese? No, right? Can you yeah. give us a whole sentence in Korean? That like paranda. Or tojota. Oh, okay. Um, I helped. I'm sorry, is much better. means interrupt or uh, okay. you know, watch a movie. Please use that. Oh, I interrupted watching of the two. I don't yeah, I don't think it's grammatical in Japanese. And if I want to say that, I have to say taro no eiga kansho samatageta. That, that's a compound with uh, uh, eiga is a movie, and uh -huh. kansho is like a, a loan from Chinese to watch. Uh, okay, so it's, movie watching. Uh, movie watching. So in the case of Japanese, I think it's a compound. It has to be a compound. Uh. 
while I, I think you're claiming that here it is a phrase. I, I, so I was wondering if there's a possibility that actually this uh, 11B has a, is a compound, film C is a compound. Oh, yeah. So, um, well, Hiryan is there, obviously. Um, so we did have example, um, Hiryan, did we have examples where we had a low VP um, uh, sort of uh, adjunct between um, the, the object noun and the verb? Like Yang Yi Yong Hua Chun Chun Yi or something like that. Yes, Yong Hi Yi bot action Yong Hua Pogido Pang Yi I like that. So say that yeah. again. Yong Yi action Yong Hua Pogido Pang Yi Hetta. But then the, the but then the object is still adjacent to the verb. Um. No, then yeah, we we don't have that kind of data. Sorry. But did, I mean, in your dissertation, did you? Um, uh, um, ah, well, yes, chun chun he. Yeah. Pali, like that. Yeah. No. Uh, 사과 빨리 먹기를. Yeah, so we can put an adverb in between. Yes. But it has to be a very low VP adverb. Um, yes. Young is. How about chal, chal? Can Yang Yi Yang Hua chal pogiru? Can you say that? Um, yes, Yang Hua chal pogiru. Sagwa pali mokiru. Yes. Uh, if we put uh the adverbial uh in front of the verb, then a nominalized verb, it's okay. Okay. Fine. So then it might be sort of like a a stronger incorporation type thing in uh in in Japanese uh than you get in in Korean. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm curious of how to represent this difference between Korean and Japanese. Well, what, what is the crucial difference here, whether prosodic or syntactic? Mm, yeah, that's a neat, uh, 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 That's what we should look at next. That's possible. <laughs> I think in Japanese, um, Taro no ega miru no samatage chatta mitaina. We can say like Taro no, it's kind of genetic marker, mm -hmm. you no, know, and ega miru no. So in the case, we drop the accusative marker. I think it's more natural, acceptable. It's I think it's kind of similar to mm. Korean. Mm -hmm. No, Taro no ega miru no samatage chatte. Okay, this is uh, after I'm going to get a bunch of Japanese data. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you all. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, this is the end of today's session, and I guess there is some announcement from the organizer. Yes, um, we are going to go to the banquet in at the Masashitakai station, and there uh, we have to use the bus, and it's uh, like, 
music can be contrarian. Okay. So the first bus will be <clears throat> leaving in 20 minutes. And the next next one is leaving in it's in 40 minutes. Okay. So uh, I take over uh, <laughs> suddenly. Uh, the important thing is, uh, thank you for today's session, but tomorrow we are not meeting here. Uh, so tomorrow we are meeting at the Dialogue House on the second floor, there's an international conference room and we'll meet there. Zoom people will just join on Zoom, but if you come here tomorrow, you won't find anyone. So please come to uh, the Dialogue House, the second floor. And then the next thing is what Rina just said about the bus time. Yes, um, one bus is in 20 minutes. About what time? Five, six. Yeah, five or six. Oh, and the next bus is? The next next bus is 526 in 40 minutes. So those who are heading to the banquet, let's meet at 5 p.m. at the bus stop uh, uh, at 93. お疲れ様でした。お疲れ様でした。